hello, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking on the new ways that EdTech is using some of the available funds uh, to help with all their digital student safety um, needs for this upcoming school year. Uh, today, we have Casey. He is our manager of bids and proposals here at Securely. Uh, he has a lot of unique insights that helps every single school uh, navigate a lot of these difficult waters with federal funding. Um, and this quick webinar is going to really cover a lot of those high level things that you need to get started. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to him and we're going to begin with our first poll. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, I think it's just a real quick snapshot to kind of look back. I mean, look back. Uh, we are already looking forward and away from 2020, but it's kind of a, a real nice thing to kind of look back at it. How many of you have used or know that you and your district and or school site have used uh, funding, whether it was the waivers that the CARES Act provided uh, for Title IV or Title II, or uh, the ESSER or ESER, depending on uh, your locale regionally, um, have used that uh, to support your remote learning or hybrid learning or re-entry into face-to-face. -face. So that's our first one, that you know you've done it. That's it. It's a nice, easy way to start, you know. <laughs> right. And if you're watching this on demand, uh, feel free to also participate as well, too. We, we definitely want to hear from everybody. So the reason why it, it, it's it's uh, it's not just in a vacuum that we're looking at this. We really need to kind of look at this uh, really holistically uh, about the monies uh, that were available last year. What is now going to be available for everyone? And on the docket, uh, as we're seeing with the new uh, White House administration um, and Congress and Senate about what's gonna be happening next potentially. So we're really looking at this uh, collectively. So as we look back at the CARES Act, uh, we know that there was uh, $13.2 billion uh, specifically for K-12. Uh, there was $3 billion uh, given to all the governors of each of the 50 states. Um, as part of their ability to use it how they want to. Most used it for uh, higher education and or uh, community college, but uh, places like uh, California, their, uh, their governor uh, Newsom uh, used it exclusively for K-12. There was $180 million that were given to school model micro grants. So those who are really kind of testing that hybrid uh, uh, remote learning model and submitted uh, like in Oklahoma, they gave a competitive grant around this. And there is a small amount of money, but significant uh, increase uh, in uh, helping substance abuse and mental health services, particularly uh, in re uh, remote learning spaces. So that, that was a look back at, at, at the money itself. And the biggest uh, impact uh, was uh, this ESSER, this Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief money uh, that was part of the CARES Act. And, and they made it really easy. The application was process was really short and it was different, but it was short. So every, all 50 states had their own way of kind of applying for it. Uh, the money was actually allocated already, but you had to go through the rigmarole of receiving it and or getting reimbursed for monies of which you had procured programs or solutions to support uh, your students. Non-public schools, they it, it, again, it depended on each state. But it was pretty difficult to kind of navigate for 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 those uh, private schools or independent schools uh, trying to receive that money. And the deadlines varied. I have an example of you know that we know that it was on March and April when the CARES Act was done. But then Ohio really uh, sped through this that they needed to have everything uh, of their application completed by May. Uh, whereas like in Arizona, it was later on in October. So again it's a roadmap for us to look at. It was a short application. It varied, but uh, there was these due dates based on the states having to uh, deal with their own uh, budgets and their uh, fiduciary responsibility. So the one piece that some districts, and, and this is where it goes back to that poll one about knowing your federal money and where the revenues are coming from for you to procure or have a feasible expenditure kind of sheet when looking at ed tech solutions. So the waivers allowed for broader use of already uh, federal money vehicles, i.e. like Title IV. We know a no number of districts uh, that we work with and I come and uh, help with that 
Uh, they're using Title IV money already uh, to support education technology and digital student safety um, solutions as part of their uh, ed tech ecosystem in their district. So there's already, districts have already done that pre-COVID and this really made it a lot easier for them, but also allowed for new districts to uh, who have not necessarily used it overtly to be able to do that. So that was part of last year's. So now that was the quick kind of overview. And you know that money was already allocated. Do you know how your 2020 CARES Act allocation supported digital teaching and learning in your district? And it was already allocated. And I think that that's, uh, it makes you, uh, I guess, uh, think about district administration, your school board, and like, you know, how are they supporting uh, you all uh, and your role and your scope of work uh, in supporting uh, 21st century student learning and a continuum of, of digital student safety, whether they are in school or uh, at home uh, kind of working. We have a new, why? Why is there this new stimulus kind of coming through? Well, as we look ahead, and, and many of you do know that there is, um, and you all might be feeling this too, about this budget shortfall, whether it's at the state level or at the district level. We know that there are different uh, revenue sources, particularly in terms of tax dollars, whether it's property taxes, whether it's excise tax, wherever, whatever it may be, and or uh, a larger percentage of your state of, of your revenue coming from state uh, tax dollars, there is these shortfalls because of the change in the, the economy and the environment that has impacted uh, tax revenue that is ultimately going to impact you all at your district on what revenue is coming in. And those annual budgets, uh, as you all know, I mean, we're, we're right in the throes of this right now as we're kind of looking ahead, both from a procurement standpoint a fiscal feasibility standpoint and what does that budget kind of look like for the next two uh, years in your district as you are projecting and of course enrollments too we know enrollments impact uh, all of your districts and ha has that shifted uh, so all of those uh, things are really important uh, factors about why this stimulus is coming in because it's it's i think the uh, white house uh, administration uh, last week uh, called it this is a this new stimulus for 2021 is a down payment. And uh, I think what they're saying is that there's potentially uh, uh, another round coming through, and we'll talk about that later. So back to the poll, we're going to keep you all in kind of engaged in this about what other funding or other federal funding are part of the next two years of your EdTech budget. So we know that the money's available. We know that these are planned out. You may or may not have uh, utilized uh, to your knowledge, overtly, uh, CARES Act 2020 and the Easter money as part of your work. So knowing all these things and you are uh, creating projections uh, moving forward, think about the ed tech budget for you all. Uh, regardless of, of where you are currently working, whether it's uh, in uh, instructional technology or IT departments, whether it, you're, you're here as part of federal programs, but support uh, hybrid or uh, remote learning, uh, teaching and learning models. This is something to be part of what you are planning out uh, from a fiscal standpoint and then ultimately from a programs and solution standpoint. And keep these questions. These questions are for uh, you all as well to think about your own departments too. So I think that's why uh, we added these to not only have you all interact, but to capture these questions and ask internally. And uh, that, that's how, that's what we want to be able to share with you. So this 2021 stimulus package, it was a lot. Was, you know, there's uh, uh, there's a lot of money that was uh, to be had here. And this is the whole thing. So this was the bipartisan right at the end of uh, uh, the Trump administration uh, in December that they signed this. And it was a combined package of different things. So we're going to really be looking at that highlighted one, that $900 billion dollar a response and relief that because that that's really where the k-12 um piece is really hidden and those gems and again these deadlines for applying for funds is all also just like last year that's why we looked back it's going to be dependent on your state it's going to be you know state of washington is going to be different from the state of arkansas uh as well as state of hawaii so it's going to be all different so you really have to kind of know 
how that works. So within that, of that $900 billion package, there's about $82 billion earmarked for education. Of that, there's $54 billion nationally that will go towards K-12 education. And of course, everything, okay, well, that's divided by 50 states, but there's all these other things. So we'll, we'll talk about how that kind of looks. Overtly, and I know there's some of you here who are from non-public schools, there's $4 billion for the governor's fund that is already earmarked that so private schools are able to utilize this uh, money for their K-12 teaching and learning, how they deem is appropriate for them. So there is some, you know, we're seeing what they, what uh, our government learned from the CARES Act and what they're doing differently. But the, but one thing that is the same is that it's all different uh, in terms of each state's application, but also that they're using the Title One money to kind of figure out what you, what your actual allocation is. So your Title One population and the monies that were allocated in 2019 are kind of those markers of like, you know, uh, how much money you would get, uh, be allocated. Okay, so. Casey, you shared with us, uh, we looked back and then we looked at a little bit now. What's the kind of difference from a 30,000 foot of, of, of this package? Well, you know, if, if they're calling this a down payment, I think uh, uh, the CARES Act funding was almost like seed money in, in, in the, in the uh, VC world, right? So there was a little bit of money. If you look at the totals, just kind of look at this and see what the impact is um, to you all. I, th I think, you know, m most of the money is from the CARES Act in totality things like PPEs and things like that from a health and safety standpoint. And then now we're kind of seeing this shift on, okay, can monies now be used more strategically and looking at the next 12 to 24 months as we're looking into reopening schools and supporting our, our teachers, uh, parents and students in a different way. So that's what I kind of, I, I, I grasp at uh, here in taking a look at the two monies that were allocated for K-12 nationally. And again, like last year, based on Title I uh, distributions. So those are those federal guidelines. And there's some other requirements too, right? Like uh, how much uh, should be given to uh, districts, providing uh, site leaders, so principals and site leaders, they have to have the resources to get their schools back to reopening, but in a transition. There's, an, there's some overt language about differentiated or defined student groups. So uh, what they call student subpopulations, right? Uh, particularly disadvantaged and marginalized students that uh, from an equity standpoint, planning and implementing activities as they are looking what happened and looking ahead, what long-term closures, providing technology for online, providing online ongoing guidance uh, for teachers, parents, and students for online learning, but meet IDEA and ed services as part of that. So, so you're, they're bringing in a lot more folks to help support the students. So we're, as I'm thinking, and, and we'll see in terms of, of what ways that can, what vehicles are going to be able to do that. That's going to be like title two for your professional learning. So there's some real overt things that are, that are on here that I guess we didn't think about before. We said, Hey, we just got to get some money to schools, but now it's getting a little bit more. Uh, strategic. So what can the money be used for? Uh, very similar uh, in terms of education technology and what guidelines in terms of how the procurement and reimbursement in some states are going to take place and what guidelines you have to use. And of course, we have a new uh, Secretary of Education that's going to, uh, in the White House, is going to help guide that as well. So this is where the this mix of policy and uh, fiduciary responsibility from uh, the federal government and how that's trickled down to the states is really going to be important. And that's what we have this year to uh, be able to share with you um, when these issues come about in, ju in just in time. They're not calling it waivers as they did in the 2020 CARES Act. They're calling it federal appropriations. So there, there's some, this is again, this is that augmented policy that allows for greater use of money that is already there. And maybe not just giving cash, but giving ability in terms of these like Title Four, uh, Title Four A grants on number three. There, there's a lot more money. It's an increase of money, but then there's waivers of hey, you don't have to spend only 15% of that money on ed tech as a cap. Open that up a little bit. So that's where working with federal programs, understanding is this a one time? Is this going to be part of our ed tech budgeting moving forward? I mean, those kinds of questions are important to ask now, particularly as we look ahead 
for you all on what procurement uh, looks like. The other difference is the reporting. So here's kind of then, you know, there was a little, a little more of a green flag of like, hey, use the money, buy it, let's, let, let's get, we just got to uh, get this going. And there's some re reporting requirements from the feds. And of course, each state is going to have to figure out how to get that funding, uh, get that reporting for how districts are using the funding. But there's a little bit more uh, detail that needs to be had by districts on what they're using uh, the money for. So, so that, that's something to keep in mind. It's not going to be as easy for those who uh, have used it before. Now, like I said, this, you know, we had this kind of seed money. We had this kind of down payment. Is there anything uh, new coming? Well, one thing I am watching for is uh, small things, right? Like uh, the appointment of the new FCC uh, chair and what she did and who she is as a mom and taking care of her two kids at home. And she was really overt in some op-ed pieces about what the FCC can do to create access and equity for more students. So it's going to be really interesting to see that. I know there's been a, a lot of our friends at COSIN and, and whatnot really kind of pushing for this idea of E-rate legislation um, as it impacts companies like us and how we work with all of you. A new $1.9 trillion package it's, it looks like it's going to be proposed by the president for later this year. And if, and then looking at just the policy, the draft of the policy, about another $170 billion for K-12 schools, particularly for reopening. It looks like that's going to be on the, the initial. So if we go back and kind of look at how much the CARES Act was and the and the ESSER money, what this money is, the $54 billion uh, in this new but looking at 170 billion for K-12 schools to reopen. I know we talk about, I mean, we talk about big government and, uh, but this is what they are looking at ahead. So it's really important to look at ed, uh, education policy and how this may impact um, all of you. So your current uh, distance learning infrastructure, how it aligns with what your district is looking at uh, in terms of their plans. Thinking about not only the federal policies uh, that we read that we see on the news or read how that trickles down to what the state policies are and then what that aligns with your community in your state and then again you have to look at everything right we're looking back on what districts has spent on cares act was that a uh, one time or is that something that's part of how uh, your district's going to operate and then what about the uh, new stimulus money and the federal appropriations uh, that you all can use in terms of a balanced budget and, you know, there's always language. They really follow that Title IV language about with kids being remote and not face to face for a whole year, how we're supporting them uh, from an ed tech standpoint, infrastructure. But the, as we say in the title, that digital student safety piece and the social emotional learning that is, I mean, we're seeing that overt in the fine details of this new stimulus. So be aware of that on the student mental health. Not only as counselors and teachers are working with them face to face or one on one online, but all the students and what infrastructures are there to allow a healthy uh, student environment. And that leads us to uh, the, our last poll uh, of today. And I said SEL or social emotional learning and student health is is overt in a, a lot of the detail, particularly on the reporting. Think about why SEL is important in the CARES Act and the new ESSER, uh, what well, they're calling it ESSER 2 funding currently, this for 2021. So even though you are, you know, uh, where you all are working on infrastructure and your bandwidth and all of these things, but you're doing this because of what? And that's where the uh, social emotional learning of the students and the well-being of the teachers is really important. All right, well. Thanks, Casey. Um, so, I mean, I kind of put a any better than what you did um, and again when you're when you're making these questions to you know others in your team um, figuring out how this all works in relation to ramping up for uh, coming back to school in the fall or whether you're trying to uh, address the challenges of you know virtual learning right now uh, securely does fit a lot of those pegs so um, certainly look at us when it comes to a lot of those kind of challenges, we help with you know, empowering teachers to use, you know, have remote uh, viewing, uh, seeing the screens, pushing lesson plans, controlling tabs and screens, one-on-one -on -one communication. We empower, uh, again, also teachers, but also 
guidance counselors and parents with understanding the effects of what all of this remote learning or just isolation at home is doing, right? And and identifying uh, areas of concern if needed and being able to engage well before anything troubling potentially happens. We're 100% in the cloud, meaning that we're extremely easy to deploy. So again, when you're making uh, these decisions, you're looking at funding um, and you're figuring out how this all works together, take a look at us, especially if you're uh, needing help in what we uh, help with specifically. I think that's the the end of our presentation, Casey. Uh, you know, we, we're doing, uh, we have a few people on right now, but we'll also be sharing this on demand. Uh, if you have questions and you're watching this, whether it's on YouTube or you found this from our social, um, feel free to put a question in. Um, we'll be happy to respond, reach back out to you. Um, if you're using the Q&A widget, that's off to the side. All those questions come directly to us um, and either myself or Casey um, will make sure we get your answer uh, directed to you. Um, and, and Casey also put a whole bunch of resources available. If you're watching this in our webinar platform, all of these are um, added to our little handout section off to the, the right-hand side. So you can click on any of those, learn a lot more. Uh, Casey, uh, for these resources, is there anything specific you wanted to point out? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I, it's put together uh, in a, a nice cadence of, of the ESSER2 fact sheet, just kind of an overview. Then there was always that question, well, what, do, what about us? How much money do we get? And that's where we were able to kind of see this uh, use from uh, uh, whiteboard advisors, uh, searchable estimation, individual state allocation of money, and then just some guidance in terms of being careful about spending one-time money. And the last piece is just a, a, a blog that we all shared uh, with our audience last year about the CARES Act. And again, it's again, good to kind of look at everything in totality, uh, both back, now, and ahead. Awesome. Well, Casey, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for uh, agreeing to hop on this uh, and share this excellent information with everybody. Hopefully you and the audience got something out of this and hopefully maybe it sparked uh, you know some ideas on things that you know maybe this funding can help you, uh, maybe initiatives that you you've always wanted to go for or maybe something that um, you, know, you want to help address now. Um, we're here to help you navigate these waters. So feel free to reach out. Um, Casey, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, and thanks everybody for joining us. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, everyone.